you have heard about Mannheim. So let me just ask a question to start the, the session. How many people here know about Mannheim, what we do? Wow. Is that because of the introduction sessions and the <laughs> conferences? Because usually when I ask that question, most of the hands don't go up. Um, so I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about. Oh, thank you very much. Um, can I go to presentation mode or? Well, I it's, 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 we can I, leave every it. Every time I was doing it earlier, it right. just seemed to mess up. So no, let's, le let's, let's leave it then, uh, rather than uh, deal with potential technical difficulties. We have too many technical guys in here. Um, <laughs> things are going to go wrong with technology in that case. That, that's, I, I wasn't going to say that. Um, so, so um, and, and let me just get a sense for the audience. So um, how many senior IT leaders, uh, CTO, CIO, SVPs, how many practitioners who actually do work? Um, Okay, good, good, just, just checking. All right, so, so what I'm going to do quickly is talk a little bit about Mannheim and um, Cox Automotive. Mannheim is a part of Cox Enterprises, and Cox Automotive is actually a newly formed entity that um, includes Mannheim and a few other companies. I will talk a little bit about who I am, a little bit beyond what we, we just talked about, to give you some context. And then I'll get into our objectives for agility and speed. I'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned over the last year or so that I've been at Mannheim and some of the things that we're doing um, to really get to um, scale, agile at scale, basically. So, and I'm not just talking about agile methodology, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about agility as a business and having technology enable that, okay? So, since everybody here knows Mannheim, I'll go through this really quickly. We're the world's largest auto remarketing company um, we have been in the digital space selling cars, helping, helping our, our customers sell cars and buy cars uh, for a very long time, over a decade. Um, you know, when, you, when, you, when we run our live auctions, which is one of the ways that we help move vehicles, we actually have a simulcast feed of that auction. And just to give you a sense for the kinds of digital capabilities we have, we can't buffer those. You can't have people bidding on a car online and have it be buffered and five minutes delayed, five minutes delayed. So, we have to make sure our video streams online are all up to date, um, running in, in real time all the time. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that we've been doing for decades, right? Well, over a decade. Um, we, we touch about 8 million cars a year. That's an old stat. I think it's probably more, more by now. Um, we run about $50 billion worth of transactions to our system. Um, and with the advent of, of um, our financial entity, NextGear, I think we touch close to $100 billion of money right, flowing through our organization uh, every year. So uh, it's, it's, it's a big company. Um, we've struggled, like many other big companies, with, with uh, being agile and, and flexible from a technology perspective. And we are making a big push into more digital innovative products. Digitization is impacting our industry like everybody else. We want to lead that. We want to drive that. And, um, Basically, that's what I'm going to talk about today, how we're, how we're making strides towards that. So for those of you that don't know Cox Automotive and Cox in general, um, Cox Enterprises is a $15 billion conglomerate based here in, in Atlanta. Okay? Um, the automotive division includes Mannheim, which is the largest entity. We're close to $3 billion in revenue. But it also includes autotrader.com, which people tend to be more familiar with, obviously. Right, more consumer-oriented company. Kelly Blue Book is also a part of Cox Automotive. People don't know that. Um, and then we have a ton of others that, that people generally don't know if they're not in the auto industry. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them today. All I will say is many of these companies, some of them are wholly software companies. Right? So we're, we're not a company that just moves metal around. Right? We're, we're actually more of a digital company uh, than anything else. In fact, when I was being recruited, to join Mannheim, uh, the president of the company, the president of Cox Automotive, said to me, I can't imagine anything we would do to add billions to our top line that wouldn't have technology at the core of it, right? So we really are a technology company in many ways. And so <coughs> that's what excites me, and that's why I'm there. And, and um, you know, our teams are working to make that more and more real every day. No. Oh. Oh. Okay, so a little bit about me. I was a management consultant for many years, gave a lot of advice, uh, delivered a lot of programs, large programs for clients, and um, 
decided one day that, oh, it went ahead, it skipped ahead because I pressed the button so many times. Decided one day I would stop advising and start actually taking accountability for, for results on a long-term basis. As a consultant, I did take accountability for results, but I'm sorry, this thing's flipping around like crazy. <laughs> uh, let's try that again. Um, I just won't keep pressing it. Anyway, I'll let the, the slides catch up. So decided to become a CIO and um, went to a smaller company based here in Atlanta called PRGX, which is a data analytics company. Um, at, at my last gig in consulting, I was working with the likes of, well, I won't say the client name, a client with a $2 billion IT budget up in Boston trying to help them with their IT strategy. So I've done a lot of big company stuff. But to prove I could be a CIO, I went to a small company and, and, and cut my teeth for a few years there. And uh, then Mannheim came calling, and, and here I am. Okay. Let me switch to the next one. My passion, I don't know technology at all. I shouldn't say it that way. I'm not a technologist. I'm a leader of teams, right? That's my job. My passion is really getting teams to do more than they thought they could. And, um, you know, when you get a bunch of high-performing teams together and they're doing more than they thought they could, special things happen. And that's, that's what I'm all about, right? And so if you have any technical questions during this conversation, I will not be able to answer them. Let me just say it that way. Um, and and I'm, I'm passionate about technology, right? But, but I'm not a technologist. I cannot get on a keyboard now and, and start coding in Ruby, which, which our teams love to do. Um, <clears throat> We've all recognized, and we in Mannheim have recognized this as well, that the path to digital innovation success is, is, is unpredictable. If we try to lay out a roadmap, a five-year roadmap, this is the product that we're going to launch in this year, and it's going to have these features, and we'll be wrong the minute we, we put that out. Right? Customers are coming to us all the time, pushing us in new directions that we hadn't thought about. Um, we are observing our industry and seeing some changes happen faster than we thought. You know, you guys have all heard about driverless cars by now, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. When we talked about that last year, we were like, that might be 20 years out. Now we're like, well, maybe that's five years out. We don't, we don't quite know. But what's that going to do to an industry, an automotive industry, the automotive industry, when those come, come down the pipe? Um, so we, we're, we're having to be very flexible, think, think in a way that allows us to, to jump from opportunity to opportunity. And if we're not agile and if we're wasting a bunch of time and, and energy not getting stuff out the door, we're not going to be able to keep up. So ultimately, you know, we, we want to be the, the big company, the elephant that's able to be also very agile. Um, somebody looked at this slide and said, you really want to refer to Mannheim as an elephant. But uh, so, so we, may, we may have to reuse this slide when I give this talk next. But, but at the end of the day, that's the, the representation of what we're trying to be. The big ship that turns on a dime, the elephant that rides a unicycle, right? That's who we want to be. We also want to use our size to our advantage when it comes to getting speed. Size typically is not associated with speed. Bureaucracy sets in when you're big. You need lots of layers to manage all those people, so on and so forth. But we believe we can actually fix that and get faster and use our size as an advantage, not as a, as a detriment to speed. And while we're doing all that, we have to continue to be stable. right? And uh, Times will get more and more turbulent, and our head of infrastructure operations sometimes pulls our hair out because we're changing stuff much more rapidly than we ever had before. Things break more often than they, they have before, but I'm saying to her, sorry, we're, we're going to have to keep it up and keep it changing. And she's really good. She's getting there, and we, we're, we're all moving on a journey. Um, and she's awesome. She's, she's taking us down that path. But that's, that's the kind of conversation we have to have. It's an and conversation now. It's not an or conversation. You can either change a lot or be stable. Which one? No longer that. It's going to be changing a lot and be stable. And there are obviously techniques for doing that that we'll talk about today. I also asked, am I going to get more money to do all this digital innovation stuff? And they said, no. You have to find a way to, to stretch the dollars you have. That's actually not true. We are investing a lot of money. But the expectation is every dollar spent will generate more uh, at a return. So, we have to make that happen, and, and, and we will. So we took all of that as input. You know, this is the kind of business we want to be. And then we looked at our operating model and realized that it was a square peg 
trying to fit into a round hole, right? It just wasn't set up to do that. We had a traditional IT shop, factory, central factory model. You get work coming in, you spin up projects, you deliver the projects, you spin them down. And in that model, when the demand kept going up and up and up and up and up, we ended up in a place that, that was not fun, right? Everybody complaining, we're not delivering fast enough. They were gracious and nice. It's a great place to work. People are nice people, but but they weren't they weren't able we weren't able to hit our business objectives because we kept slowing down, right? Getting slower and slower. And that's not a that's not a ding against a team. We're all doing our best and everybody's doing a good job. But we had to change the way we operate because the current models won't work in the future that we're trying to build. Okay. And one of the things that we observed is when we had steady state, all we were doing was ERP upgrades and a few tweaks to our products from time to time. That central factory model worked pretty well, right? Work came in, it goes through the, the process and comes out the back end. We were already agile, so we were doing a lot of work in an agile methodology. So we were fast in that context. But what we found is as the demand started to, to balloon, it's not that we got more things coming in and we just resisted some of it and then say it's got the same amount of work out the back end. With that increased demand, you end up pulling people like developers in to do more estimation. And you pull them away from delivering. And over time, you end up in a world where people are doing so much work to try and manage the funnel at the top that you end up doing less work to push work out the bottom. And so you end up with less output, not more, even though you have more demand and the same resources and the same, uh, same money, same everything. So that's something that we observed, and I, I believe it's true of many companies. I have seen that phenomenon in many companies. And it's natural when you try to run things in a factory, right, where you have this big central unit trying to take work in and, and deliver it out the back end. Anybody experience that anywhere? OK, so we're not alone in that experience. So what do we do about it? I mean, I've been talking for a while here, and I haven't actually gotten to any so what. So, so let's get to the so what. Um, we tried some things, right? We did some experiments. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. So we're going to talk about that. We now know what not to do, we believe, in a lot of areas. I'm sure we've not done learning, but, but that's one thing that we have learned. And then we have some principles that we've sort of formed that are core to how we operate going forward. And I, and I use the word principles on purpose because this is not about defining an organizational structure and processes and locking everything down and doing everything the same way, you don't get speed that way. So you have to start referring to, to principles and starting to have guiding principles around how you do things. And then you have to have very clear objectives from a business standpoint, and you let your teams run. So the word principle is here on purpose, guiding principle, what, whatever you know, words you want to put around it. But, but we're, we're trying to live by sort of principles. And then we put an operating model together that allows for the flexibility to, to live within these principles so our teams can actually get the job done. And I'll talk about more about that in a, in a minute. I, I found this slide, put the image in, thought it was a great image. Ultimately, we're trying to drive a business mindset among our technologists. Because what we've found is if you want speed, you have to push the work down to the people actually doing it and let them get the job done, let them make some decisions. But if they don't have a business mindset, that won't happen. So we're pushing for that business mindset. The thing I noticed about the slide just before I presented is that somebody who put it together didn't know how to spell the word cost. So for those of you that recognize that, please don't hold it against me. I do know how to spell cost. I just didn't catch it right when I was putting it together. But, but the slide itself is really good because it talks about the things we need to be thinking about as technologists if we're really trying to become agile fast and, and eliminate waste. And it's, it's the kinds of things that all tie back to why we're all where we are, unless you work for a nonprofit. It's about our business. Right? I've given talks before. I think I gave a big data talk sometimes back, and I said to the audience, how many people in here are in uh, technology? And everybody raised their hand. How many people here are in, the, in business? In the business? Nobody raised their hand. And I asked them if they all work for nonprofits. So that's, uh, that's something that bugs me, that we don't, a lot of times, don't think of ourselves as business people first. That just happened to me in a technology function. I don't hear my marketing colleagues referring to the business separate from themselves. And I would encourage us all to do the same thing, right? We are business people first. Well, inside of Manhattan Technology, that's something that we're pushing very hard. And we're, we're, it takes time, but we're driving that mindset. 
And we have a lot of people who live like that, and we have a lot of people who are starting to live more like that, and, and we expect to drive that home more and more. So if I see somebody in the hall and ask them how their project's going, and they tell me it's going fine, it's on track, it's on time, it's on budget, I'll ask them next, and what are you trying to accomplish? And they'll say, roll out this product by the state. And I go, why? And they go, because somebody asked for it. <laughs> why are they asking for it? What are you asking me? What, what do you want me to tell you? I want you to tell me why you're working on what you're working on. Do you care? That's the kind of mindset that we're trying to push. Okay? And it's working. It's working. In fact, Dana Lowenthal at the back of the room is driving a lot of that for us across our talent organization, across the entire talent base we have. And sh she deserves all the credit for, for the progress that we've made on that front. I really am a CTO who sits in my office and takes credit for the work of my team all day. I don't do anything. So it's, it's up to them. Right? The, the other thing that we, we have to be clear about, you have a business mindset. You also have to make sure everything you do has a very clear objective and target, and everybody on the team knows it. Everybody on the team knows it. The developers need to know it. The QA people need to know it. The BAs need to know it. Everybody needs to know why they're working on what they're working on. And it goes back to what I just said. It's the business result I'm trying to get. Right? And if we can't explain it, then we're probably not going to hit the goal. Right? Because once again, we want our teams to be more autonomous. And if you want them to be autonomous, they better have the information they need to make good decisions. Right? We also decided that bureaucracy is a bad thing. In my opinion, bureaucracy is generally put in place. Bureaucracy meaning we have to follow these steps, these processes, these activities that don't directly add value to what you're trying to deliver but we have them in place for a reason. And the reason usually is because we don't trust people. That's my, I had that revelation a year ago. It's all about trust. If you don't trust somebody to deliver software into production and not break stuff, you put the very heavy change management process in place so they have to jump through some hoops to prove that they're not gonna break stuff. Well, we've put that on its head. We've said, if you break stuff, you can go a quarter. If you break stuff in that quarter, you have to go through that heavy process. You don't break anything, for a quarter, you get to deploy without anybody getting on your, on your back and asking you too many questions. And our developers love that, and it, it's an incentive thing for them now. We found that they actually care more about the deployment process because they have an incentive and they understand what you're trying to do than when we put all these hoops there because what they would say is, I did my part. Now it's up to the other people to figure out whether I made a mistake or not. And if I did make a mistake, it's not me, it's them that caught it, and I will do my part to fix it. Now we're going, if you don't want to go through all those hoops, then you build software that just goes into production flawlessly and you'll be fine. We won't talk to you again. You can not talk to the operations guys ever again if you don't want to, but it's up to you. So when I say accept when earned, you can earn bureaucracy, but we will take it out of your way if you show us that you don't need it. And if there's a law that says you must check this or you must check that, you must follow these rules, and yes, we will follow those, or a contract, or something like that. Make sense? Anybody here a fan of bureaucracy? I ask that question, and, and people say no, and then you get into conversations, and they start to tell you all these reasons to put bureaucracy in place, and I go, well, sounds like a fan of bureaucracy. The other thing I'll say about bureaucracy is, you know, engineers tend to, to be the best at this. You make a mistake, you go, why did it happen? What was the root cause? How will we stop it from happening ever again? Sometimes when you ask the question, how often did that thing happen? Has it ever happened before? Why are we putting something in place to stop it? That's going to add potentially millions of dollars of waste and cost to our process over time to stop something that happened once in a decade and cost us $20,000. But we always want to solve problems in an engineering mindset, a logical mindset. Happened, don't want it to happen, find a way to stop it from happening, and we don't do the math that says, is it worth it to stop it? And so my discussion a lot of times with my business peers is, you want us to go fast and you want us to be flexible? Things will break sometimes. Now you can live with that or I can go slow and make sure they don't break, but you have to pick. Because we will make some mistakes, people will be incented not to make them, but they will make them. And if you want me to put checks and balances in to stop mistakes from happening, I need a billion dollars just for that, because I can stop mistakes if you want that to be the focus. That is not our focus, and bureaucracy is all about stopping things from happening because you don't want people to make mistakes, or 
we think they might be malicious, which is another thing that, that we put bureaucracy in place for. And I found very rarely are people malicious when they work in, inside a business. So I kind of touched on principle four. You know, we, we, we have to be willing to fail. And we have to be willing to sort of let go of stuff when it's not working, all right? You become a product manager inside of Mannheim and you take an idea forward and you do a market test on it and nobody comes and nobody buys. It's hard to go, my baby is ugly, right? You want to go, well, it must be something that we're doing wrong. Let's keep investing in this thing. Worse still, you, you sort of put aside money to go invest in the thing and not even do a market test. And you spend a year building the thing, you roll it out and nobody comes. We have to be willing to sort of admit when things don't work. We have to be willing to fail. And it's hard, but, but, but we believe that we're getting there across our enterprise, not just in technology. We're just helping the rest of the organization understand these things. Elon Musk, I believe, said this. I found it on LinkedIn, so I'm not sure it's actually true. He said it, but, but I'm attributing, attributing it to him. Uh, he runs Tesla Motors. You know, basically, he says, if you're not failing, you're not innovating, and, and I agree. Right? We use the term fail fast all the time. Well, you know, this is about failing fast. Facebook at one point said, move fast and break things. That was a little too extreme for me. I don't want the mantra to be break things, right? But, but I knew what they meant. The other thing we do is we do market tests whenever we can when we don't really understand the, the assumptions behind our business cases. When people start to say, if we do this, we're going to get lots of revenue. I go, how do you know? The model says it. My assumptions are these things. How do you know that assumption's right? And I go, well, we talked to a few customers and it feels right. It breaks down very easily if you dig in to the business cases, usually. but. We still go invest tons of money on stuff that don't pay off, and then we forget to check whether or not it paid off at the back end, right? So we, we are, as an organization, pushing to do more testing of ideas in quick and dirty ways with, with, with imperfect architectures and duct tape and glue, just to make sure that we understand those assumptions and narrow our confidence so we can drive forward. going to go forward two pages, I think, shortly here. Yeah, just if you mind hitting down. That didn't work either. Oh, it might have been the, oh, there we go. Good. Um, <clears throat> so the other principle, and my, my boss actually says this all the time, we, we are, we're focused on 80% solutions. For those of you that are agile aficionados, you know, we're talking about minimum viable product. I mean, at the end of the day, in my view, it's about taking the 20% effort to get 80% of the value, and sometimes stopping there, right, depending on where you are. It's getting something out the door and making sure that you deliver value faster. In the traditional IT world, we like to lay out every single requirement. When you're doing projects in a factory, all of your customers go, the project's here. If I don't get my requirements in now, I will never get them. And so you add everything you can possibly think of to the scope. And then you deliver it over the course of a year, and half of the stuff you put in wasn't used, if you're lucky. Sometimes none of it, right? Um, in our view, if you think there's an idea, get the core elements of the idea defined and release that. And then we can iterate on top of that if we need to. Okay. This is not new stuff. Anybody ever heard of eight, nev anybody here never heard of the 80-20 rule? I, I didn't think so. Anybody here never heard of agile and iteration, minimum viable product? I mean, it's not new concepts. The issue is the clarity of how you apply it, right? Because it's hard when people are asking for stuff to go, why do you need that? It's hard when your CEO is saying, we need to put that in, to go, why do we need that? That's the courage you need to actually get here, it's my, in my opinion. Um, and I think we are on the way to getting here at Mannheim. Um, and we're all on board with this. And this is probably the most important principle. My job is to light a fire on my team to get them fired up, right? It's not to tell them what to do and how to do it. Sometimes it's to tell them what to do. It's very rarely to tell them how to do it because I have no idea. Um, it's really to light the fire, get the passion, get the engagement up so that they will do special things for the company, right? In a very autonomous way. And that's how we operate. And that's where we're going. 
we operate like this a lot today. We will operate more like this over time. A lot of what we're doing is a journey. I've been with Manheim a year. Took a little while to learn. Now we're implementing some changes. So far, we've had some good success. These are all things that we are following as principles to drive that. I just said this. So we are actually making some big changes to our operation based on those principles. I'll talk about some of them really, really quickly, and then I'll stop and, and let, let us have some questions, if that's OK. Um, power to the people is our mantra. And it's not our mantra. I just put it in, and I want to make it our mantra. Um, we're moving towards small distributed autonomous teams that have a clear purpose in mind. They're not working on projects anymore. They're working on a business objective that somebody said we can hit that is important to the future of our company. And they go deliver that. They get to stay together, work together, get productive together, improve together over a relatively long period of time. And you get rid of a couple things when you operate in that model. One, you don't get the project, I have to put everything in it mindset because the, the thing will continue for a period of time. There's no end date. You get teams that actually learn the subject matter and know what they're doing really, really well. You get teams that know how to work well together and they, they, they drive value together and get faster over time. When you keep spinning up projects and writing them down, the teams have to norm and form and learn how to work together for a while and then they get productive sort of towards the latter part of the project and then you stop them from working together and go put them on new teams. This model we think is important. And it took a while to sell this. You have to change the way you fund the things. You have to change the way you talk about the business. You have to change the way you talk about strategy and capabilities. And then you put teams to go work on capabilities that we believe as a company will drive the next billion in revenue. Not working on how they've always worked. What can I do to keep myself busy if I'm on a pro product team? That's not how we're working anymore. We're working on stuff that actually drives value for a company. And we definitely want to stop doing projects when it comes to those competitive advantage areas of our business. Um, we will still do projects in certain parts of our business. I'm not going to keep a, a team around continuing to evolve our financial systems. But when we have to do an upgrade to our ERP systems, we'll spin up a team, do that, and, and wind them down. So don't think we're crazy. We're not saying everything has to be done in this way. But the stuff that really drives our business has to be. And that's how we're going we're gonna to do it. For those of you who are agile, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Those teams that I'm talking about are agile teams. Um, we follow Scrum, but part of the autonomy discussion is should we always be Scrum or should we let the team pick what model they want? That's one of the debates we're having. And so far, we've said it's Scrum, but we might change that. If, if a team comes in and says, I don't want to follow Scrum, I have no reason to not have that conversation. right? Um, we we align those teams in groups, product groups that are very relevant, you know, grouping so that they can coordinate when they need to. But in general, we try to set the teams up so they don't have to mess with each other, so they can stay going fast. Bureaucracy slips in when you have to coordinate critical path items across 20 teams, right? Then you have to put in lots of program management structures, and we try to make sure the teams can keep working their backlogs and keep it in unencumbered. Um, with all the other stuff that's going on. It's not always possible, and so when we do need to coordinate, we try to have them in groups so that there's some structure to help manage that. But we try not to make that structure too heavy. Right? Try to keep it as light as possible, and only when needed. Okay. We had to make some tough decisions about our legacy architecture. Stuff that we wanted to change a lot, I'm using really technical terms here, and the architecture was crap. Excuse my French. This is being filmed too, right? Um, so lots of change. The architecture is not aligned. We have to fix the architecture. Right? If the architecture is a monolithic thing and it's hard to change, but we want it to be something that drives value in the future, I'm going to change it a lot. Fix it. Right? What does that mean? What do you want new features and products that fit into this category? The answer is no. The architecture is not ready. We're going to spend time fixing. But we're going to drive some revenue. You told me it was a competitive advantage driver. Billions of dollars of value. You want to drive a million dollars of incremental revenue with a new feature, pick one. Right? And I'm, I'm being stark here, but that's important because if, you don't, if you're not strong in those conversations, you cannot clean up your monolithic architectures. You cannot get to a flexible architecture if you don't 
take the gut, have the guts to actually stop putting more and more stuff on top of the old <coughs> cracking architecture. And so we're making those decisions and have made some, and it's painful. When you tell a product manager, your product will get no investment for the, a period of time so we can go re-architect it and rebuild it, they go, so what am I supposed to do for a few years? Well, help us go re-architect and build it. Help us release things in mobile ways that are the new version of that thing onto mobile devices to start, and we'll eventually get back to a product that orchestrates things in the way your product was, and then we'll grow from there. But help us get there. That's what you're going to do. And so we've had those conversations. If we're not changing the stuff and the architecture is crap, for the architects in the room, then don't touch it. I don't care how bad the architecture is. We're not going to use it. We're not going to change it. Leave it alone. A lot of times companies do one or the other. We're either going to go all in and modernize our architecture or all in and keep trying to operate the way we have. The point is make good decisions based on what you're going to do with it. And the key driver is how much is it going to change. And I'm sorry. I know I'm over time, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to the end quickly here. We're doing some other things because we believe in trying to attract good talent, but we also believe in... Um, reading writing on the wall and a lot of people have told me cloud is bad although I haven't heard that as much lately because it's not secure all this other stuff I don't want to run a utility so we're gonna move stuff into the cloud as much as possible and let Amazon run our utility or somebody else run our utility and we will run our software development and the things that really drive competitive advantage for us so all new stuff is born in the cloud is how we refer to it today typically with Amazon but not necessarily um, we do some stuff with Azure and others. We're constantly making progress towards true continuous delivery, um, which means delivering any time of the day or night when, you, when you're ready. We're not there yet, but that's where we're going. Some teams are there, but not all. Um, we do things like blue-green deployments where we will spring traffic to an, an exact replica of, well, there's two versions of production. But we can make changes in one and swing traffic there, see how it's going, and then spin, turn this one down and turn that one up, right? That kind of a model. So we're doing some pretty interesting things that other people have done. This is not new. This is not rocket science. But we're doing it, and we're, we're pushing it hard. And, and um, we believe we have a pretty progressive technology shop that's doing interesting things. Sometimes we're too, prog too progressive. We were the largest Ruby on Rails shop for a while in all of America, or at least in the Southeast, um, because we just said, Ruby's the latest thing, let's go start coding in it, and we let our teams do that. Sometimes that's not good when, when the technology is not the best for some of the stuff we're trying to do in, in robust data management areas, for example. So we, we have to manage that, but in general, we will try new things. And when you break your teams up into autonomous teams and you break your architecture up into modules, I don't care what technology sits behind a particular service. As long as it scales, it performs, and does its job, I'm fine. So we, we, we're, we're, we're not, don't, don't get the sense that we're chaotic, but we're willing to listen to our developers when they say, hey, I want to start doing Node.js stuff, and I want to start doing whatever the technologies are. And I just heard those words. I don't know what they mean, right? So I'm just, I'm just throwing them up. Um, adopting a mobile-first mindset. We talk about service-oriented architectures. We talk about small widgets being, this is the term I use with my business partner, widgets being orchestrated in many ways, new ways, and products. But what happens when you tell a team, go build something, they tend to always go to the technologists, building it for a desktop footprint. And what you end up doing is you take things that should actually be individual widgets, and you combine them when you build the app. So we're telling them, build it for a phone first. Our product teams are our technologists, and so they have to think in terms of small widgets. And we found that that's the best forcing factor for the architectural discipline we're looking for. <clears throat> around service orientation. It's a better forcing fa factor than giving them design principles and you know, patterns and all that other stuff, at least from my vantage point as a business guy. And for shared platforms and products, it must scale forever. It must, it must be robust. It can't go down. Right. Um, I talked about minimizing cross-team um, dependencies. And we believe in getting rid of bureaucracy and talking to each other. So product and engineering used to have contracts. There are some requirements. OK, I got those. How are you signing off on these? Let me go build it. I build it. That's not what I wanted. That's what the requirements said. Yeah, but I didn't have to write this in, did I? 
you didn't write it in, it's not in the code. It was all about vendor, customer, doing battle over a contract. If we can get rid of those all together, I would. You still have to write requirements down, but it's conversations. And if you trust each other and you're allowed to fail, then nobody, nobody has to go and say, you screwed up or you screwed up. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. You can have real conversations. And we, we're trying to get there. That's hard. It's hard because it's hard to get over the, this thing didn't work. Whose fault was it? That's, that's the root cause of all of those things. But we try hard to sort of say, are we really asking whose fault it is? Or are we asking what do we need to do to fix it? And our leadership team, my peers and I, it starts with us. And we're, we're trying to drive that mindset all the way through. And we're making good progress. And we'll, we'll get to a point where that's the natural response to everything. Who cares whose fault it was? Let's just fix it. Okay. And um, we're looking for exceptional people. I'm not making a pitch. I'm just, you know, it's part of the story. Um, because this is, it's not the normal, normal IT organization in a big company. We want people who think like startup players, people who want to be in startups but don't want to move to the West Coast. We'll take them all day long. They have to be talented and strong. They have to be business minded. They have to be curious about customers. We don't want people who say, it's not my job to know the customer. My job is to code, right? That's not who we want. And there's some more stuff there, I promise. Um, <laughs> if you want to be trusted, but you want to get a lot of rope, and sometimes you're going to fail, and you're going to feel the pressure of that, we are for you. If you want somebody to cover your back, tell you what decisions to make, so you don't have to take ownership of anything, then you won't be happy with us over time. Um, people who are restless, and people who are willing to engage and say they don't believe something, regardless of who's up on stage or in front of them, we look for those kinds of people too. Right? Everybody on my team is requested to come debate me anytime they disagree with me. And it takes a while for people to start trusting you to go, you really want to you really want me to tell you you're wrong, yes. But I think people in the room here who worked with me, and Dana can tell you, I, I, I respect you more if you tell me I'm wrong. Even if you're wrong, and, and, and I prove you wrong, <laughs> um, I, I, I res I, the respect goes up. Because a lot of times I'm wrong. In fact, more often than not, I probably am. And I just, my own ego won't admit that. But, but, but our, teams, our teams have to be willing to engage and debate. And so that's... That's how we think about the world. That's some of what we've done to change the world in Mannheim. And we're looking for people to jump on the ship to help us. That's it for the presentation. I think we have like well, maybe no time left for questions. But I mean, as long as people have time, we have a few minutes. Are, are, are you OK with a few minutes? Sure. I saw your hand go up first. Thanks, Michael. I uh, appreciate it. Faster, but yes. Uh, right, exactly. Exponential. So a lot of companies are having to find the resources wherever they can. Mm -hmm. So I was just interested in knowing what do you see as outsourced versus full time? So today I'll tell you what we are, and then I'll tell you where we want to be. Today we're about 50 50 outsourced versus full time employees. For the stuff that drive our competitive advantage, where we'll have these teams, I want those to be entirely employee, right? That's the guts of our business for the future. Uh, and, and mobile development's a big part of that. So we have an uphill battle to go hire a whole bunch of people. Um, and that's hard, because everybody's hiring the same bunch of people. Part of what we have to do well is to tell our story so people understand who we are and what we want to be like. This is almost a dry run for that story, right? Because we're making the changes. We need to go tell the world that this is the kind of place we are. And we hope that there will be enough people out there who want to work in a place like this, that we have the problems of Google and Facebook, right? Too many applicants, not, not too few. That will take time. But I'm not answering your question in terms of, I'm not going to give you like specific yeah, metrics, yeah. But, but, but that's where we are. By the way, before I say, I say anything else, if you know people who want to be like or like this, looking for a job, tell them to come straight to my LinkedIn page and connect with me. If they're not a vendor, then I will, I will engage. 
sorry, I say that because I have a lot of vendors engaging. Sorry, so there was an order there. I think you were next, and then you, and then you. Mm-hmm. Um, Ken Gavranovich. Yeah. Yep. Uh, interesting guy. Yep. Uh, he, he was in your same thing. He was about 50 50. Yep. Now he's got all employees except for two. Yep. And, but they're consultants that work there with them. Yep. You have wide open space, product manager at the yep. corner, and just releases every day. Yep. A lot of technology around that, but a lot of money to give to that. That's right. And I'm trying to find a way to pick Ken's brain and make sure we, we do that in a broader Mannheim organization. We're affiliated, right? But, but that's exactly the same model that we want to employ at a bigger scale. Um, so we're doing it, right? We have hundreds of developers. I think he did it with 30 or 40, which is great. He just wanted to do it. That's right, that's right, right, that's right. Um, okay, so, you, you, sorry, you first and then you too. Thanks, my name is Jim Kroll. I'm, I'm a big proponent of the self-organizing teams, especially when you're trying to sell a customer dilemma. I love that portion. Um, in that infrastructure, though, who is the ambassador in your environment? You've touched on this a couple times mm -hmm. that, that draws the line between this is the quickest thing to solve this yep. and how do we stay in line with the overarching goal. Right. So architecture has decision rights over architecture. Our enterprise architecture and solution architecture team, headed by a guy named Mark Richardson, he runs that team. And solution architects are embedded in our portfolio groups. And they work with every single team. And ultimately, they, they, they do have patterns and rules and things that people have to follow. So we have bright line rules, and then we have things you can go do yourself but we should at least stay in touch. And so we use that model, and, and Mark's team gets to say, I know we don't have a rule for that, but we should. You cannot do that if, if, if it's going to cause us to move off of a, 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 an architecture that will truly scale and be flexible over time. I mean, speed is the enemy of speed, meaning you go really, really fast, the absolute fastest you can go in the short run. You always end up with chaos that makes you slow down in the long run. You have to balance that so that you get speed, but with some control so that you can keep sustained speed over time. It's, it's an architectural problem. And so we, we, we treat it as such. Does that, I hope that makes sense. It does, yeah. Okay. Uh, behind um, you and then and you. Briefly, my question was, as you began to transition to the agile methodology, um, what were the challenges you had in place or you could have had? And what would you have done differently? So, so to be clear, we had Agile before I even joined. I've been in the company for a year. Um, we, had, we had Agile in many places in Waterfall and others. Um, so I'll answer the question in two ways. When you're moving from Waterfall to Agile and you believe in the Waterfall methodology and you hear the, the standard complaints about Agile, right? It's too loose and no commitments and you really want to just fund things forever, all that stuff. You, you, um, you know, it's, it's just a change issue. To me, it's about people and change. When you tell the story of what we're trying to be and why, people get it, that's the first step. But then there's still the, but I don't know if I can do that. And so it's just a matter of helping them get there and understand it. And we struggle with it, like everybody else, but, but people are getting it, right? There's less of that resistance, maybe because we've just said we're doing it, and so if you want to resist it, it's clear you don't want to be on the ship. Um, so that's one thing, but but I think over time it's, it's just a natural sort of we see it, we learn it, we touch it, we feel it, we know what it is, and now it doesn't feel so scary. So it's all about people change. It's not it's not the methodology that's the problem. It's it's people being able to wrap their head around change, um, and so we manage it as such. I think the other part of that conversation is agile development is part of a broader agile operating philosophy for a business it has to be. Otherwise you get waterfall thinking and then you do a lot of iterations to deliver the thing that was designed as a monolithic thing. That to me is not agile. So the harder thing was actually going into areas we don't control and having those conversations and saying you guys should stop setting up projects and start 
working with us on capability teams. Product management team, you need to break up the way you do product management and start doing product management this way. That's harder to accomplish, but luckily for us, we have really good business partners who want what's best for our company, and we're all working together on that, and so we're getting there as well. We have to influence that conversation, and we are, and they're all working with us in the right ways. So. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm going back to your building the team that you, you envision to have 100% in, in, like inside your uh, team. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how do you cope up with new technology? Like, mm -hmm. of course, well, you are investing a lot of, lot of uh, money and time in training. Mm -hmm. Now, you have your developers who are working on technology X, and the technology X, Y is coming up, and people have started working on it, and yeah. they have three, five, three to five years of experience. Now, you catch up with the technology Y. Right. How, do you, how do you train those people, like your, your inside, inside so, people? So, so we have a different problem. Because we've told people, we want you to be autonomous and do what you think is right, and if you think the technologies we're using aren't the right ones, speak up. We actually have the reverse problem of people coming and saying, this thing just came out, nobody's using it yet, but I want to try it, and I want to be the first to do it. Um, and that's a problem only in the sense of sometimes things aren't ready for prime time, and I don't want to be betting our competitive advantage assets on them, right, just yet. So, so I, we don't have the problem of not keeping up with the technology. Now, do, how do you bring it in, right, and when do you deploy it? That's a conversation I have my architects and my developers face off on all the time, right? There's a real conversation there. Um, a lot of times we expose those conversations. We have something called Innovation Shark Tank at Mannheim, where technology teams can get together and come pitch whatever they want to pitch to senior executives. And so you will see ideas like, there's a drone guy on our team. He says, you know, we could use drones and RFID to go figure out where cars are on our lots. And it would be cheaper than having to put a lot of RFID stations in. We're not going to use RFID, it's old technology, we use other things like beacons. But his idea, and he showed us, is you can mount an RFID reader on a drone and have it fly over the cars, and these kinds of things come out from our teams all the time. They're very innovative folks. So I found if you leave, give them the flexibility and the freedom to actually engage, look at technology, and bring their ideas forward, and not laugh at the idea, even if it's sometimes funny, um, and actually engage them in a conversation. You won't run into an issue where you're stagnant with technology. Architecturally, it's challenging because you can't be running every single technology under the sun in your shop. Um, and there's certain things like our data layer where we have to make really good decisions before we go deploy. We can't just be trying different things out, right? Um, we're all in NoSQL now because of where we're trying to go, right? We can't have somebody going from, from SQL Server to Oracle when we need to be NoSQL, right? So some of that has to be managed. But, um, but uh, we're not facing that as a challenge right now. We tend to be more cutting edge than, than many others. Right? Okay. Here and then here. Hi, I'm Brenda. Um, when you talk about product, do you have um, situations where you have a product that is so widely uh, utilized mm -hmm. across different business areas and different IT shops? How do you manage? So, so when you do have the monolithic beast that runs our business and generates $2 billion, of, or manages $2 billion worth of transactions over the course of a year, millions of dollars a day, and you're trying to get innovative and fast with small teams, if I'm hearing your question right, how do you marry those two together? Because we have a very real problem of a really fast, innovative team can break your business, right? And we've had a few of those examples where that has happened. Um, and so what we, have to be do, what we have to do is be very smart about how we... Once again, it all goes back to architecture. So what we've done is we've tried to insulate the core transaction system from all the other small teams building new things by building layers around it, building APIs around it where we can, which takes work in the monolithic system to actually rip it apart a little bit and, and wrap it properly. But we've done that in areas where the transaction system will survive. It's not an area of innovation for us, um, but we wrapped it so that other things that are sources of innovation that need the data out of that system, we've put buffers in place so it, these things can't break that. And so it boils down to architecture and then some of those rules, right? You're on one of those teams. You cannot write directly to our 
legacy AS400 systems that run our transactions. If you do that, you will be fired because it's what we call the bright line rule. Um, and we haven't had anybody break that after that bright line rule went in place. They have to go through the APIs. And sometimes they have to wait for an API to be extended so they can actually come through it. But that's the nature of the beast because I can't risk the $2 billion of revenue even though we're working towards the next $2 billion. I want all four. I don't want, I don't want uh, to lose this two. Right? Did that answer your question? Partially. So there's, there's a way to do it and a way not to do it. The way we tried to do it was through project governance, right? We all want to go here and get another $2 billion, and you want to do stuff that, that changes this. We want to build really cool functionality with these agile teams for the future, and we need to decide what projects we want to do and make sure that we, we manage the project pipeline so that we don't get into some of the issues that you're facing across the enterprise, different business units. That was a failure. Because now you're looking at hundreds of projects. And at one point we said, everything comes to the executive committee for decision. OK, here are your 50 projects today that we want to talk about. That doesn't work, right? So we went to this more, and this is the model that we're rolling out now, this capability model that says we will organize those teams in capability areas. And we'll make decisions like, this transaction system, I'm not going to tweak it anymore. It works. They're requested to tweak it. Lots of business people want to tweak it. Uh, our biggest customer sat across the table from me. I won't tell you who they are, because I'm about to tell you what they said. And they said, do you know how much business I do with you? I'm asking for this very simple request. You guys used to do these things all the time for us, but now I'm hearing no, and I hear it's your fault. Mr. CTO, do you want to lose our business for, for Mannheim? And I went, with the backing of my, I didn't say this, but with the backing of the CEO and other people, we went, we're trying to help you in these new ways. And I, I cannot keep doing these things to help you over here. If you want this, please understand we're not going to do this. If you don't want this, well, I'm sorry we're not going to do this. Now, please don't leave us. You have to get to the level of courage as a leadership team, and you have to get aligned enough to say with each other, if our biggest customer threatens to leave us because we're not continuing to do stuff we said we wouldn't do, then we will let them leave. And then we'll work like hell to keep it. Yeah. Right? Is that, I hope that makes sense. It, it all boils down to courage and then getting aligned at the leadership level. Everything else then flows out of that. And to, specifically to your question is to tell people, we're not doing these things. We're only doing these things. And they have to be aligned around that. No backdoor channels. No shadow IT channels. Right? All the things that pop up when you say no. We have to all agree. Right? And hold each other accountable. It's hard, though. That is the toughest thing that we face every day. One other question that someone who was not able to attend, and they actually have three or four questions that they sure. answered, but they were curious about offshoring and mm -hmm. if you were able to kind of stay within the agile uh, model with offshore teams or right. if, if you were just how that was working, I guess, from your capacity. So we have some offshore people helping us with keeping the lights on with our core systems through vendors. Um, and then we have one unit that's doing some offshore work uh, around one of our new product innovation areas. And I'm about to have dinner with the head of that unit, technology of that unit, tomorrow night to talk about why we're doing that and we shouldn't do it anymore. I do not believe if you want to be truly agile and fast that you can do it in an offshore way. I used to work at Infosys, and they got close, but the investment you have to make in people that sit beside the customer and the teams here and how you have to communicate. You need people who don't want to sleep, right? Because you have to be with the customer in the day, and then you have to be with your team at night, and that doesn't work, um, in my experience. Um, but for the project stuff, right? remember I said there are parts of our business you still do as regular projects that comes into the pipeline. You, you ramp up a team. Yeah, you can do those offshore all day long, because you can write specs. Those can be more waterfall. You deliver the project, and then you move on. They're not driving our revenue growth. They're driving just keeping the lights on of the business. Those kinds of things I will do offshore all day long if I didn't have capacity to do it onshore. Um, 
and, and we also, it's important to know this work for company Cox Enterprises. Cox as a whole takes care of its people. And I don't believe, nobody said this to me, but I don't believe that there's this push, right, to cut costs at the expense of people because you have a family. This is my opinion. I don't know if anybody said this to me. That has to walk down the street and see all the people they employ. And I don't think you'll ever see at Cox a big push to do offshoring. That's my opinion. Like I said, nobody said that to me. Um, and so there's some factors. There's nobody coming to me and going, you need to get some more savings. They're coming to me and saying, you have to get faster. And you have to drive an, an agile, flexible operation. And so because of that, offshoring is not really a focus for us, except where it's keeping lights on, low cost parts of our business, which is a smaller and smaller part of what we do. Hope that I answered more than the question, but I wanted to make that point about who, who we are when it comes to offshoring. By the way, no, no issue with offshoring, right? It, it, it helps a lot of companies get more, more productive, but you can't be fast and agile at offshore, my opinion. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Oh, one more question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. No, that, that, that slide was not a representation of concept to delivery. No, no kind of order there. Um, solution architects support multiple teams typically in our operation. And so <coughs> that was just showing the people who tend to support multiple teams at the bottom of the slide. Solution architects typically get involved very early in the concept part of the discussion and will oftentimes help shape the path of the delivery with the team. Um, they're not like sort of a gatekeeper at the end or anything like that. They're, they're engaged in the conversations. We need many more of them, by the way, because to me that's a linchpin capability. That and product owners who can influence their business partners and can actually engage in conversations instead of that CYA bureaucracy we talked about, that's another skill set that we're trying to ramp up a lot of people. Those are hard to find, but it's core for us. Developers as well, right? They're all we're hiring. I just say that, right? <laughs> but but uh, solution architects, good ones, are really really hard to find, and we're we're looking for them particularly and product owners. Okay. Any other rules, Dana, that I'm missing that we really 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 want to find people? Product owner, or solution architect. Anything else you would say, other than develop the normal roles, or no? That's right. Well. Um, in the past, they bring yes. them well upstream to figure out how to actually deploy the solution. Right. In the past, they always end up being the ones that are sitting at the bottom of the hill. Um, and so, with their partnership and um, bringing that capability further upstream and expectation process, we'll be able to have better ideas on how to test, um, especially with our integrated solution. So, so, getting QA people who know how to do automation and are willing to engage in business conversations very early, that's another area that we're, we're expecting to pivot a team and ramp up some capacity. Okay. Does that make sense? Or did, 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 okay, all right, I want to make sure I answered your question. Sorry, I went over even further. No problem. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Great job. Thank you, guys. <laughs>